Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Quadrant Chamber's seminar on two very recent and important decisions from the Supreme Court on the related and thorny topics of mitigation, damages and force majeure. In Sharp and Viterra, the Supreme Court considered the question of the correct measure of damages for non-acceptance of goods and the scope of the court's power on a Section 69 appeal. In RTI and Muir Shipping, the court addressed the question of when, if ever, a contracting party is required to accept non-contractual performance from its counterparty in order to overcome the effects of a force majeure event. I'm delighted to say that we have counsel uh, for, Vita uh, sorry, for Sharp. <laughs> and counsel for RTI uh, here with us today. They're all members of Quadrant Chambers and they're going to give us their particular insights into the case uh, this evening. By way of quick introduction, first we have Ben Gardner, a junior counsel for Sharp. Ben is recognised as a leading junior in the fields of international arbitration, energy and shipping and commodities, and is, as one client has said, a joy to work with. <laughs> Shirag may have something to say about that. Uh, right, yeah. uh, then we have Shirag Career KC, leading counsel for Sharp. Uh, Shirag is a leading practitioner in the shipping and commodities field and is described by the legal directories as an extremely intelligent, highly erudite and tactically astute barrister. Again, Ben, you may have some comeback. Yes. Uh, and then making up this fabulous trio, we have James Shirley, who is junior counsel for RTI. James is also a leading junior in shipping and commodities, who is described as having excellent legal knowledge, smooth advocacy, and being unflappable under pressure. Well, we will see. <laughs> um, now, this panel relish an interventionist tribunal, um, so we'd be delighted to take any questions um, as you go. So if you do have any questions or thoughts, please raise your hands and we'll try and work them in. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Ben to discuss Sharp and Viterra. Thank you very much, Gemma, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the facts of Sharp and Viterra, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the appeal, which was on the limits of Section 69 of the Arbitration Act. Uh, and then I'm going to hand over to Shirag to talk about the, uh, the cross appeal, our cross appeal uh, on, on damages. So let me set the scene first with Sharp. Um, like many commercial cases that reach the Supreme Court, it, uh, it, it had incredibly gra glamorous facts. Uh, the dispute concerned a shipment of peas and lentils, uh, and the seller, uh, Viterra, uh, had sold the goods on a CNF basis uh, so that the buyer uh, Sharp, uh, our clients, was obliged to pay for those goods against uh, the presentation of the shipping documents. Um, the buyer failed to pay, uh, and so the sellers could have walked away at that stage, but they, they didn't, uh, and that's why we're all here today. Uh, instead, they decided to land the goods uh, at the uh, discharge port of Mundra and to store them in uh, a warehouse after they had cleared customs. Uh, now, while the goods were sat uh, in the warehouse in Mundra, uh, awaiting the buyer to pay for the goods, uh, the Indian government uh, slapped some pretty hefty import taxes on peas and lentils. Um, so the result was that the goods that were in the warehouse, having been customs cleared, were worth a lot more than goods that were not customs cleared, goods that you might buy uh, afloat or uh, on a CNF basis. Um, eventually the sellers lost their patience, uh, they terminated the contract and they claimed damages for their loss of bargain. Uh, the quantum issue, which made it up to the Supreme Court, uh, is a short one. Um, should the seller's loss be assessed by reference to the price that the seller would obtain uh, if they bought some more goods in the load port, Vancouver, shipped them and sold them on a CNF basis to uh, um, uh, a new buyer? Or should the loss be assessed by reference to the price that the seller could obtain on the local market for the goods that were actually sat in a warehouse in Mundra, having been cleared through customs? Uh, and the difference was several million dollars because of these, these new import duties that were, that were slapped on the, on the goods after customs clearance. So if we can look at the first slide, I haven't tested this out, so we'll see whether it works. There we go, the GAFTA default clause. Um, uh, this um, was the clause in our case, and it's also a very common clause in, GAF clause in GAFTA and phosphor contracts. Uh, and for any of you who are not soft commodities lawyers, don't zone out just yet because it also reflects the common law in relation to the assessment of damages in, in ways that Chirag will talk about shortly. Uh, but, but the essential uh, thrust of it is in subsection A, there's a measure of damages, which is essentially the, the price that the innocent party secures by buying or selling goods. Uh, but either party can say they don't want to use that price. And then you put a line through A and you move on to C, 
uh, and you ask the arbitrators to value, uh, to, to put the actual or estimated value of the goods on the date of default, and you compare that against the contract price. Uh, and it's that subsection C measure, uh, which was the measure that both parties said applied in, in our case. So the question was, what was the actual or estimated value of the goods? And as I just mentioned, there, was a, there, were, there were rival cases as to how one actually put a value on, uh, on the peas and lentils in our case. So what happened uh, up until the Supreme Court? Um, the GAFTA Appeal Board uh, held that an earlier Supreme Court decision, uh, Bungie and Nadira, uh, meant that the seller's loss had to be assessed by comparing the contract price uh, with the price that the sellers could realise by reselling the goods on the date of default on exactly the same terms other than price as the original contract. Uh, and so on that basis, it didn't matter where the goods were, it didn't matter what the... Uh, sellers might reasonably do with them. All you did was look at the contract that had been breached, and then you imagine the seller concluding a new contract on those terms. Um, and on that basis, one looked at the CNF price, or in this case, the FOB Vancouver price, plus some shipping costs. Um, now, when giving permission to appeal under Section 69 of the Arbitration Act, Mr. Justice Jacobs thought this was obviously wrong. But uh, Mrs. Justice Cockrell, uh, when she was hearing the Section 69 appeal, disagreed. She thought that the arbitrators had uh, interpreted Bungie and Nadira correctly. Uh, and because the sale was on a CNF Mundra terms, damages must be assessed uh, as the arbitrators had assessed them, based on a new CNF Mundra sale. Uh, and the fact that the goods could not actually be sold on a CNF Mundra basis anymore because they were sat in a warehouse in Mundra didn't matter. The Court of Appeal agreed with that analysis, except for one uh, important difference. Uh, in their view, the key to the case actually lay in, in the fact that the parties had agreed that the sellers would land the goods in Mundra and put them into a warehouse. Uh, and so uh, in the Court of Appeals' view, there was, a, there was an amendment to the contract, and the contract was no longer a CNF contract at all. It was now a contract for the sale of uh, goods X warehouse Mundra. Uh, so that was the contract breached, and therefore the new uh, contract, the substitute contract, was to be... Uh, on that same basis. The result of that was the Court of Appeal got to the same result as the buyers had been arguing for, but by a completely different route. Um, so it was a sort of, it was a victory for the buyers in the Court of Appeal, but not <laughs> on the grounds that uh, uh, they had been arguing. Um, so then we get to the Supreme Court. Uh, the sellers appealed from this, uh, this Court of Appeal decision, and they said the Court of Appeal had done various things they shouldn't have done, uh, that they had exceeded their powers under Section 69 of the Arbitration Act. Uh, and before I hand over to Chirag, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about that, that challenge to the, uh, the Court of Appeals decision uh, under Section 69 and what, what Lord Hamblin, giving the judgment of the Supreme Court, had to make of those Section 69 challenges. Um, so if I can then go on to my second slide, for anyone who's got very good eyesight, uh, that is Section 69, or some of it, um, but uh, I don't think you need to read it, so don't panic if you can't at the back. Um, the, the sellers had three complaints. Um, the first one uh, was uh, that under Section 69.4 of the Act, an application for leave to appeal uh, must identify a question of law, and it's that question of law on which the, uh, the court gives permission, and then there's a, a hearing, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, there's a hearing of that Section 69 appeal on the basis of the question of law for which permission has already been given. Um, and once the question's been given, uh, the sellers say it can't be changed. Now, the reason that objection arose was because the Court of Appeal, when answering the question about the amended contract, had said, well, the, the question law is phrased very broadly. It's phrased in abstract terms about a CNF contract uh, in general. But we need to add the words in the circumstances as found by the arbitrators to make sense of the question. Um, now, Lord Hamblin, uh, giving the leading judgment, held that the that the court on a Section 69 appeal can amend the, uh, the letter, but not the spirit of a question of law during the appeal hearing. Uh, and he put it another way, the substance of the question of law must remain the same. Uh, as the Court of Appeal had only said what was already implicit in the question, which is that the question has to be answered against the facts of the case, uh, that was not changing the substance of the question, it was only changing the letter of it, uh, and therefore this objection didn't work. Um, and I think the uh, the judgment of the Supreme Court here leaves uh, sort of leaves in place the the practice uh, of uh, parties drafting questions of law to make them sound as broad and important as they can uh, in order to get permission and therefore potentially to clear the general public importance hurdle. Uh, 
the second objection uh, that the set has made was uh, under section 69.3b, uh, and that was that the arbitrator has never been asked the question of whether the contract had been amended and whether the valuation should in fact be on the basis of the uh, amended contract. Um, now, this was, uh, strictly speaking, uh, correct, which puts us in a bit of a difficult position, um, <laughs> because the, the buyer's case had always been uh, that the goods should be valued as is, where is it? Had been, that had been the position uh, in, the, in the arbitration, and it had been the permission, position going up through the courts as well. Um, we had some attempt to say that the issue in very general terms was before the be, before the arbitrators. There was a question about what the amendments were in a different context, but Lord Hamblin did not, the Supreme Court did not accept that, uh, that argument. He considered that the question raised on the appeal had to be fairly and squarely before the arbitration tribunal for determination and on the basis that, that the case was not run in the way that the Court of Appeal decided it um, essentially of their own motion, um, it, 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 was, uh, it, it, it breached section 69.3b and the requirement for the, the, uh, the point to have been put to the arbitrators. And the third and final objection uh, that the sellers raised was uh, under section 69.3c. Uh, the Court of Appeal uh, had made findings of fact that, uh, about the alleged amendment to the sale contracts which were not found in the arbitration awards. And that's the point that they found that this was no longer CNF uh, sale because uh, the, the court uh, inferred that the bills of lading had been given up to the ship in order to obtain discharge before the goods were put into the warehouse. And that was the basis for the finding that it was no longer a CNF sale. Um, again, strictly speaking, that, uh, that was probably right. Uh, we had a good go at arguing <laughs> that um, one could look at the arbitration awards very carefully and find that this was a finding implicit in them. Uh, but Lord Hamblin was, was not convinced by that. Um, he, he held that, the, uh, that there had been previous authority to the fact that any factual inference must be truly beyond a rational argument. But that probably put the test too high for inferences to be drawn from an award. Uh, but own, the only factual inferences that could be drawn on a Section 69 appeal uh, were ones which inevitably follow from the findings in the award. Um, and in this case, it did not inevitably follow from the findings that were expressed in the award uh, that the bills of lading had been given up to the ship owners. Uh, and so that uh, essential finding was, was not one in the awards and that challenge was successful. Uh, and I think, again, this is a quite a useful reminder uh, for practitioners that um, all of your points need to be taken in the arbitration. And actually, when, when, um, when a client might come to you at, at a later stage and say, what do you think? It's no good thinking I've got this great new way of putting the case because um, it's too late. Um, so I think that, that it's, a, it's helpful as a reminder that Section 57 is, is, an, is, a, is a useful tool to clear up any ambiguities in the award before you launch into your Section 69 appeal. If you get into your 69, Section 69 appeal and find that there is an ambiguity, it's too late to, to do anything about it at that stage. So that's what I want to say about the appeal, um, the, the bad news of the buyers. I'm going to hand over now to Sherag to talk about the rather happier news <coughs> of the buyers on the cross appeal. Well, spoiler alert. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Now, <clears throat> you might think that our success in the Supreme Court is all down to Ben because uh, uh, I did the case on my own at first instance and in the Court of Appeal. And although I won in the Court of Appeal, it was not on a ground that I ever argued. <laughs> and uh, indeed, if you read the judgment, uh, curiously, it says, you know, uh, with, with a raised eyebrow, Lord Justice Popowell says, well, very reluctantly, Mr. Kari accepted this as a fallback argument. Um, so we did win technically, and we, we got exactly what we wanted in the Court, court of Appeal. But neither the first instance judge nor the Court of Appeal accepted our central argument, which, as Ben has pointed out, was always that these goods were there in Mundra. They had been customs cleared, they had been landed, and they were available for resale. And it made no sense to value anything other than those goods in these circumstances. Um, now, that was accepted as sort of being almost obviously right by Mr. Justice Jacobs on giving permission. But then, uh, uh, at first instance, before Mrs. Justice Cockrell and in the Court of Appeal, that was rejected. So we, of course, having been faced with the appeal on the section, uh, section 69 issues that Ben has just discussed, applied for cross-appeal and said, you know that argument that we raised at first instance and in the Court of Appeal, which they thought was rubbish, 
we think it's right. And luckily, we got permission. So what did we argue? Well, we argued what we had always argued. This is an as is, you have to value it as is, where is, because that is the only way to give effect to the true economic and commercial value of the goods that are left in the seller's hands. Um, on the other hand, Vitera um, argued that Bungie and Nidera, the Supreme Court decision on, on very odd, also on the default clause, but involving a repudiatory anticipatory breach, um, required you to absolutely <coughs> replicate the contract that had been breached. And if that's done, and you're looking at a CNFFO contract, <coughs> that takes out of the equation the increase in the value of the goods caused by a result of them having been landed and customs cleared in Mundra. Luckily, the Supreme Court reversing both the Court of Appeal and the Commercial Court, and indeed the view of both the Appeal Board and the original GAFTA Board, held that that was correct. Now, how did the Supreme Court get to that? Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of the default clause, which I put up there, um, Mr. Justice Hamblin, speaking for a unanimous Supreme Court, made some very important points, the most important of which was to elevate the principle of mitigation into a fundamental principle of the law of damages. So we, we all know from the Golden Victory and from Bungie and Nider itself that the compensatory principle is fundamental and then all measures of damages that you use are simply guides in order to get to what is the true loss of the party that is claiming. And what our case does is it elevates and brings at the same level the principle of mitigation. And indeed, Lord Hamblin says that the two principles work together because usually measures of damages require a deemed mitigation. And so you need to look at what is reasonable under all the circumstances, even if that was, <coughs> was not what the innocent party did. So, so the big headline point for the law of damages generally is the principle of mitigation of damages as a fundamental principle sitting alongside the compensatory principle. Uh, having enunciated that, uh, the Supreme Court went and looked at the clause, um, which is uh, in front of you there on the screen, and pointed out, as Lord Sumption had pointed out in Bungie and Nidera, that clause A deals with actual mitigation. So an innocent seller or an innocent buyer actually goes into the market and either sells or buys. And then you take the value of that sale or purchase as the basis for assessing damages. And if, for example, the innocent party doesn't do that, or as in our case, the innocent party, Viterra, did do that, but they sold to a related Glencore entity. So both parties argued that it, you shouldn't use this value. Um, then you go to subclause C. And subclause C then gives the arbitral tribunal the option of either using the actual mitigation under subclause A or determining the actual or estimated value of the goods on the date of default. Now, the tribunal did not, and both parties agreed that they should not use the actual value of the price at which. Viterra had sold to a related entity. Viterra said, oh, those were on different terms. They weren't CNFFO terms. They were X warehouse. And my client said, well, that was a related party transaction. They sold at an undervalue. And in fact, when their related party then sold into the Indian market, that's when they made the big, big bucks. So, uh, so how do you apply the actual or estimated value of the goods? Now, the fundamental rule the Supreme Court said, both in relation to subclause C and under sections uh, 50, subsections 3 and 51, subsection 3, is to work out the, what a substitute contract reasonably made would so as to result in a reasonable measure of the party's loss. Now, if there is an available market, then the value will be assessed on that available market. If there is no available market, 
then you have to look at what market, other market, it would have been reasonable for this particular seller or buyer to have contracted in. And you assume that that person did that, whether it did so or not. And we know from the Elena Damico, which again was affirmed, as it has been thousands of times, that what the innocent party actually does, if the innocent party decides to wait, then it speculates on its own account. And if it decides to go to some different strange market, it speculates on its own account. So, and the Supreme Court said, if you look, given that there was a finding that there was no CNFFO market for these goods, then the obvious market in which the goods should be sold and would reasonably be sold by a reasonable seller would be the domestic market in Mundra. And indeed, as we had repeatedly pointed out, it was almost, it would be absolutely logical and indeed, if not impossible, for those goods to be sold in any other market because they'd been customs cleared. So you'd have to get them out of customs um, if you could. Uh, and that may take, God knows, months, years or whatever, and they would, it would have no uh, commercial sense. And having come to that view, both on the construction of subclause C and uh, by analogy with the Sale of Goods Act, uh, the Supreme Court set out five additional grounds that supported that view. First of all, um, clearing up a lot of law, Lord Hamblin said that that was also the way the Common Law and the Sale of Goods Act worked in a CIF contract. Um, the Court of Appeal had, had doubted that severely, um, even though we'd cited all the cases for that. And relying on a couple of first instance decisions from Roche and a dictum of Lord Justice Diplock, um, the Supreme Court said that if there is a breach, let's say by non-acceptance of under a CIF contract, you look at the state, at stage at which the contract's performance is at. So if it's still on the, on, on the water and there is a market for goods afloat, then you would look to value on that market. If either it's no longer afloat or there is no market afloat, then you have to look at the destination. Because as uh, Roche J pointed out in one of the cases, once you ship the goods, CIF, they're irrevitably, irrevitably, uh, inevitably going to the destination. You can't stop the ship. So, so that was the first point. The second point is you have to bear in mind the actual reality of the situation in that the sellers had been left with these goods still in their hands in Mundra. And therefore, the question is, what is the value of those goods? And it doesn't make sense to look at some other goods. It's these goods. And indeed, as we had argued throughout, uh, to not much success until the Supreme Court, uh, it the what the tribunal had done didn't even consist of a sale, never mind a sale of those goods. It consisted of a purchase of hypothetical goods in, Mund in Vancouver, plus their freight to go to Mundra. The third point that the Supreme Court um, accepted from us was that you have to construe subclause C consistently with subclause A. We had always argued that since subclause A applies only where there's been actual mitigation and where the goods are in Mundra customs controlled, customs cleared, that would imply a sale into the domestic market. Subclause C should also be in the same market. Now both the, Supreme, both the first instance judge and the Court of Appeal had not accepted that. The Supreme Court absolutely did accept that and said that they're both trying to value the same thing. Fourthly, um, there was the requirement to be consistent with the compensatory principle. You couldn't lose sight and you should not lose sight of the fact that the sellers were left with an asset on their hands that had a particular value where it was, where it was located and as it was circumstanced. 
And, and those are the words that the Supreme Court uses. And if you ask yourself, where was it located? It was located in Mundra. How was it circumstanced? Well, it was customs cleared. And the customs cleared meant that the value had gone up 30%, 40%. Fifthly, um, and this is more tied in with the actual facts of this case, that construction was also consistent with the way the tribunal had dealt with two other issues. One, um, when to fix the date of default, and they'd fixed the date of default only when the sellers had access to the goods and were able to resell them. And that recognized that it's the resale of this, these goods that is relevant. Uh, and secondly, at, the buyers had incurred the expense of discharging them, and the GAFTA tribunal had reimbursed that money um, to the buyers, the defaulting buyers, because the sellers had now the benefit of that discharge. And then finally, dealing with Bungie and Nidera, which had dazzled, bedazzled, both the first instance and the Court of Appeal. Um, the Supreme Court dealt with it very briefly, saying, well, you can't read it as a statute. It's a case on different facts. Um, you have to look at the pr basic principles. And finally, the decision the Supreme Court said reflected the reality of the position in which the sellers found themselves as a result of the buyer's non-acceptance. And most importantly, it gave proper effect to the fundamental principles of mitigation and the compensatory principle. And that was the decision. And what this case really shows is you have to bear both of those principles in mind when construing and applying principles, um, both contracts, sale of goods act, and common law principles when assessing damages. And with that, I will Hand on to James. Well, I might actually just pause you there because it's be a good moment. Does anybody have any questions, particularly on Sharp and Viterra? I mean, I do, but right. okay. <laughs> does anyone have any thought? Does anybody think that the Supreme Court got it wrong? Wow. Mark. Okay. Oh, we've persuaded you then. <laughs> well, 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 can I ask a question sure. then? Because looking at the GAFTA default clause, um, how if, if you're in the scenario where you've got to subclause C, how does the tribunal, um, or indeed the court looking at it, decide whether or not they should adopt the default um, price that's established by an actual substitute contract, yeah. um, or under A, or... Um, look at the actual or estimated value of the goods. Right. How, 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 what, how does the tribunal decide? I mean, you're told yeah. what to do, but but what's the, what are the guiding a, principles? That's a that's a very interesting principle. So, just for people, uh, if you haven't had a chance to digest subclause C or uh, be familiar with it, even though both parties, like in our case, rejected subclause A measure, the actual resale. That didn't prevent the tribunal from saying, actually, you know what, I'm going to accept it. Or often you might get one party saying, I like the, that value, the other party saying, we don't like it. And the clause itself gives you no guidance as to how and on what basis the tribunal is supposed to make a choice. Luckily in the Supreme Court, Lord Hamblin does, because he says, again, with this theme of the fundamental principles of mitigation and the compensatory principle, if the actual sale that has happened or the actual purchase that has happened is consistent with reasonable mitigation in the circumstances, then the tribunal would may well simply choose that. So in this case, if there had been a resale of the goods in Mundra, customs cleared, which there had been, but not to a related party, but at an arm's length transaction, then they would have, the tribunal would have been justified and probably would have accepted that as the value rather than trying to speculate and create a market value. So, so again, the theme going through this case is the fundamental principles of mitigation and the compensatory principle. Okay, thank you, Sherry, that's helpful. Um, just picking up on the compensatory principle, um, maybe a question for your junior. Right. Um, but, but Ben Chirag mentioned that one of, one of the things that the um, Supreme Court relied on in, in its part of its reasoning was the compensatory principle. Yeah. And particularly, I think that 
um, the seller argued that the fact that the goods had undergone this uplift in value um, wasn't caused by the contract. It wasn't caused by the breach of contract. It had been caused by the government tariff and therefore shouldn't be taken into account. Yeah. Um, the court rejected that, applying the compensatory principle um, and said that what matters is the resulting benefit to the seller, not the cause. Now, when I read that, I actually read it as being quite a broad statement and I wondered whether or not you thought that it's maybe opening the door for it to be permissible in the assessment of damages to bring in any factor which affects the ultimate position um, of the innocent party, or does it not go that broad? I think you can read it literally as uh, as you did when you first read it, uh, Gemma, uh, as suggesting that actually this is sort of the compensatory principle sort of on steroids, and actually all that matters is the position of the seller um, on the date of default. I think in the context of the in, in the context of the argument, the the seller's case was oh well you know uh, this was just a, this was luck that the the import duty got got imposed that that shouldn't benefit the the buyer, but the answer to that that we gave, which I think is the right one, is that what you're trying to do is compensate the seller. So you've got to look at what the market position of these goods is, uh, and the market markets go up, markets go down. And import duties are sort of part of that picture of the market value of the goods. So it's not a separate benefit that you can sort of hive off in the way that you can certain other types of benefit. Um, it's all part of that economic picture of the value of the goods. So I, I don't think he meant to sort of open up uh, what's been closed down in other cases in relation to resin trials actor and, and collateral benefits. Um, uh, the case, a case I did before, where I I, I lost on uh, in the Supreme Court was on uh, in the New Flamenco on on collateral benefits, and I'm fairly sure that sort of case would still be decided yeah. in the same way, po unfortunately, post uh, post Sharp and Patera, because it wasn't really what was in issue that sort of collateral benefit question. So while you can read it like that, I don't think that's what Lord Hamilton really <laughs> meant. I think he was just speaking loosely about a particular. Uh, Issue. Yes, I suspect many uh, many council will latch onto it and try yes. and deploy sure it yeah, sure for their own ends. Can I just say one point about that? Because th this argument just drove me mad. <laughs> and it was again run at first instance in the Court of Appeal. And again, the question was market movements. And as I argued in the Supreme Court, it doesn't matter what causes market movements. The war in Ukraine wasn't caused by either of the parties to any contract of you know, purchase of oil, for example. But you have to take the into account that the market's gone up, right? The weather is not caused by a breach of contract or by the parties. But if you get excessive rain of a particular commodity, the price goes up. And Supreme Court was sort of you know, nodding along and they looked at me as I was stating the, the obvious. Um, but you know, it, it, yeah, it, it, they, kept, they kept running it. Yeah. So, and in fact, um, Mrs. Justice Cockerell even talked about a windfall and uh, and, he, and she said she said that there's no reason why the breaching party us should get the windfall caused by the uh, imposition of uh, customs dues, and you know, and I was, but they, you know this is contract. It's got nothing to do with windfall. It's simply got a, to do with measuring the loss. And luckily, the Supreme Court, it, it, it died in the Supreme Court, so yeah. it wasn't resurrected. Sorry, I just it, it, it just sort of you know. Go ahead, James. Sorry. I was going to say, <laughs> moving on. Then. Moving on before oh, I. Sorry. Um, uh, what, what, wait for the microphone, please. <laughs> <laughs> this is for the video. Okay. Sorry. Um, just going back to the sort of the wider application, yeah. um, and kind of putting the 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 general you know ditch the precise same terms and mitigation point into a, sh a shipping context, you still see the odd. You know, argument in a say an early redelivery case where you say, "Oh, you you redelivered three days early. There's no market for the ship for three days. Therefore, there's no available market." Does this or can it be used to to sort of kill off that finally? Where it's no, you just look at where the ship is at the moment. Is there a market for it? Does it have to be on the same terms? I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting question how this tracks across to those those shipping cases, Tom. I, I, I think it does open up those sorts of arguments about the what has previously been quite a strict approach to available markets <coughs> in, a, in a charter party repudiation context. And I think there's probably more scope for saying a reasonable uh, 
well, sh ship owner in this case, uh, would go into this market or enter into this type of contract, that's the deemed mitigation um, and sort of loosening up what has previously been um, quite yeah. strict rules on that. So I think, I think there is definitely scope yeah. for that to be tested out. Um, and I think it, it would give considerable support to your argument. So, well, of course, nobody enters into a three-day charter party, right? They enter into a six-month charter party or a voyage charter, right? And what would a reasonable person faced in that situation would, would do? Forget what this guy did, you know, what would the reasonable person do? And you're simply applying the fundamental principle of mitigation. And I think you've got pretty high, pretty good authority for doing that now. All right, well, we'll move on from some victorious council. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Who likes to talk uh, about their what, case? What an to, yeah. to, to James to tell us why. You run the case you've got. Why the yeah. Supreme Court got it wrong. Um, yes. Um, I'm, I'm going to start by explaining what happened in, at the various stages in the litigation and then uh, make three observations about, about the result and the differences between the Supreme Court's decision and the Court of Appeals' decision in RTI and Murr. So this was a case uh, about a contract of a freightment, so uh, a two-year contract under which Murr were uh, obliged to supply ships to carry RTI's bauxite from Guinea to the Ukraine. Uh, and importantly, for, for our purposes, uh, RTI was to make payment of freight in US dollars. The contract had been running okay for a while, but then uh, the US government announced sanctions which affected uh, RTI's parent company. Uh, and this was in April 2018, so it's not the, not the more recent uh, sanctions in 2022. Um, it, it, from yes, so this is the this is clause thirty six of the COA. It's the force majeure clause in um, R, in the RTI and Mer COA. Um, and so shortly afterwards, Mer sent RTI a notice declaring force majeure and saying that they were going to suspend performance. They said, "This is what they said on the basis of the U.S. Uh, uh, sanctions." It would be illegal in US law for them to continue performance of the COA, uh, and it would also be impossible for RTI to pay freight, and they couldn't be expected to continue performance without payment of freight. Uh, so they were going to wind down the voyages that were in progress and then cease performance. RTI said, well, we disagree with you that uh, performance is, is illegal by you. And what's more, we can, even if there's a problem paying in US dollars, we can pay in euros. We'll cover the conversion charges. And so there's absolutely no uh, detriment to you. The contract can continue just as it was con uh, carrying on before the sanctions. Mer stuck to their guns and there was a suspension of performance for two weeks. Uh, after which there were some regulatory changes, um, which didn't in fact make any difference, but Mer used them as, a, 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 felt that the situation had changed and then resumed performance. Nevertheless, because there had been two weeks suspension, RTI had had to pay other providers uh, for ships to take their bauxite to the Ukraine. And so they started an arbitration suing for damages uh, for the cost, the additional cost to them of providing, uh, of obtaining those vessels. Now, the tribunal heard expert evidence from U.S. sanctions lawyers and concluded that actually it, it hadn't been uh, illegal for Mer to continue performance, and it hadn't been impossible. It hadn't been illegal. Uh, RTI wouldn't have been prevented from making payments in U.S. dollars. But they did decide that payments in US dollars would probably have been delayed. And given that there was the, the contract envisaged this constant flow of vessels to uh, Guinea and constant payments in US dollars, that was going to be a, a problem. And they said that the clause, that clause 36, was engaged subject to uh, the clause you can see there, which is 36.3D that the, uh, essentially the delay to payment in US dollars uh, uh, cannot be overcome by reasonable endeavors from the party affected. They said it could have been overcome by reasonable endeavors uh, by Mer. They could have accepted RTI's offer to make payment in 
uh, euros. And if they had done that, there would have been, uh, and the tribunal found this, no disadvantage, no detriment whatsoever to uh, MER in accepting payments in euros. So on that basis, um, RTI succeeded in the arbitration. The force majeure uh, notice was uh, invalid and uh, uh, Mer was liable in damages. Mer appealed under section 69 uh, to the High Court. Uh, they were given permission and Mr. Justice Jacobs upheld their appeal, reversing the arbitrators and finding that they, Mer had been entitled to declare force majeure. But Mr. Justice Jacobs recognised that it was a, a, an arguable point and gave uh, RTI permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal, which they did, and we were successful in the Court of Appeal, albeit only by a majority. But even the dissenting judge, Lord Justice Arnold, said that he thought that substantively Murr's position had no merit. Um, the, 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 the position they'd taken of rejecting the offer of euros with all of the payment, all of the costs covered by RTI was one that had no substantive merit. Uh, the Court of Appeal refused permission, but the Supreme Court granted it and then reversed the decision of the Court of Appeal. Um, and if I've got a, the next slide, the final slide, uh, is, is my attempt to encapsulate the difference between the Court of Appeal's approach and the Supreme uh, Court's approach. And I've got three observations, general observations to make about the differences between the, the way that the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court approached it. The first of one is that there was a fundamental difference in the way that the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court approached the questions of the question of construction. In the hearing in the Supreme Court, it became obvious pretty near the beginning that the Supreme Court wanted to make a decision that could be applied across all force majeure clauses, wherever the obligation uh, or, or wherever there was a requirement to use reasonable endeavours um, that, that was engaged before one could declare force majeure. Uh, what they said was, uh, in the judgment, that even where reasonable endeavours clauses are not express, um, they apply, and they apply generally in force majeure uh, clauses, because they, they, they are part of the requirement that there is a causation link between the force majeure event and uh, the cessation of performance. And uh, uh, the particular thing that they pick up is that, is that uh, they don't want, it, it ensures that the behavior of the party declaring force majeure is, is not the, has not broken that link of causation. Their, their, their behavior, an unreasonable to, uh, failure to do uh, or an unreasonable uh, act has not broken the chain of causation between the force majeure event and the cessation of performance. And what the, the Supreme Court said was it is the cessation of contractual performance in particular that these clauses are directed at. Now, if one is looking in general at force majeure clauses, um, I, I think it's more understandable why the Supreme Court uh, said that contractual performance is what these clauses are uh, concerned with. But if one looks, and we can look back at Clause 36 here, if one looks at the clauses in a particular contract and in a particular force majeure clause at the way that it is written, um, it will sometimes appear, as it does here, that the clause and the contract are concerned perhaps with some aspects of performance more than performance in general. And that it might not be the case that a solution to a force majeure problem has to uh, uh, involve the performance of every letter of the contract in the strictest sense. So in this clause, 36.3b um, arguably makes it clear that the clause here is concerned with the delays uh, and the prevention uh, to loading and discharge of the cargo rather than every single aspect of performance under the contract. So RTI might say, well, um, as long as reasonable endeavours would uh, result in the performance of loading and discharge as envisaged by the contract, 
they don't need to achieve performance to the letter with regard to things like the currency of payment. Um, also, with, with, with respect to uh, the way that the courts approach the requirement of the, the, the meaning of reasonable endeavours, the Supreme Court took, again, a, a, a wide approach to that uh, and, and took the view that, that it, it could never be reasonable to, uh, it would never be reasonable to expect a party to accept something that they haven't, hadn't bargained for. So non-contractual options uh, were off the table. Whereas the Court of Appeals approach was uh, more directed at the particular facts and what had happened in the particular case. And they looked at whether what would have been required from Murr, which on the facts was nothing apart from simply accepting performance, they looked at whether that was something that was uh, reasonable in the sense that it was an easy thing to do rather than a difficult thing to do or, or a demanding thing. Um, but on that, we said as RTI, the, the tribunal had decided that it would have been reasonable for Murr to accept uh, euros in place of US dollars. So there, there should have been very little for the courts to decide because the arbitrators had already decided that. And it seems strange, um, arguably, to rule out one whole type of endeavours, i.e. those that require um, the acceptance of non-contractual performance, when there's nothing expressed in the clause which says that those kind of endeavours are excluded. It just, the clause just says reasonable endeavours would have overcome the force majeure event. So that's uh, my first observation, that there's a fundamental difference in the way that the courts approached the, the, their, their task of construing the contract. Secondly, there's a difference in the, in the role that the courts gave to commercial certainty. Now, it, it's generally accepted that there are rules of contractual construction, and if those are applied from case to case, then, there's a, there's, then that fosters commercial certainty, because one isn't just starting from scratch with every contract. There are rules which allow you to predict what, what uh, result the court uh, would reach on the construction of a contract where it's disputed. Um, but whether a, uh, uh, the right construction is one that is itself conducive to commercial certainty, or whether it is conducive to a more flexible um, result, depends. It depends surely on what the parties have intended, because the, 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 the ultimate question is what the parties intended their contract uh, to mean from an objective point of view. And, to, uh, uh, and if one goes too far in the direction of, of favouring commercial certainty, one can end up giving a clause a construction that may be commercially certain, but at the expense of what the parties intended. They might have intended something which uh, uh, involved a bit more flexibility when uh, times got tough during performance of the contract. So it, it, uh, on one reading, uh, I think it's fair to say that, the, tri that, that uh, the Supreme Court elevated commercial certainty to a place in contractual construction that it didn't previously have. Now, the, courts, the, the Supreme Court's concern, of course, was that once you started down the road of permitting or envisaging non-contractual solutions to force majeure problems, it would be hard to know where you drew the line. Now, on these particular facts, we were able to say that the tribunal found that there would have been no detriment whatsoever to Murr in accepting the Euros, and Murr didn't have to do anything, it, uh, and we could say it resulted in precisely the end result that Murr had bargained for. They ended up with US dollars in their account because the euros were converted into US dollars uh, automatically by Murr's bank. Um, and furthermore, it's hard to see, um, arguably at least, why it's RTI's concern or problem where the line might be drawn in other cases where perhaps there would be a bit of detriment to the party being asked to, to, to accept a non-contractual performance. 
or where the end result achieved by the non-contractual performance might be slightly different to uh, what was originally bargained for, and yet a, a reasonable commercial person might say it would be reasonable to accept that, for example, to permit loading and discharge to occur as envisaged by the contract. Uh, the, the, Mr. Just, uh, Lord Justice Newey in the Court of Appeal gave a very short uh, judgment agreeing with uh, Lord, Lord Justice Mayles, um, who gave the main judgment. But Lord Justice Newey put it very well. Effectively, he said, how can you say that a problem has not been overcome if all of its adverse consequences have been completely eliminated? And that was RTI's position in the Supreme Court. Uh, the third observation I wanted to make is about presumptions and a particular rule of construction called the Gilbert Ash principle, which assumed greater and greater importance in Murr's case as we got uh, higher and higher up the courts. Um, and the Supreme Court uh, said something interesting about the Gilbert Ash principle. Basically, the principle is that, or has traditionally been, that if, if the rights that parties have in the general law, by which is meant statute law or the law of tort, for example, or the law of general law of remedies, that applies whatever they've, uh, or, or, or applies in the background and on which the specific agreements they make in their contract are, uh, are layered. Um, for, for a party to give up the, the rights that they have in that general law that pre-exists the contract requires clear words in the contract. So you can, you can give up your right to particular remedies or you can give up particular statutory rights, but you'll only be taken to have done so if you've used clear words. Now, Murr uh, latched onto this principle and they said, well, you can equally apply it where if we look at one part of the contract and we see a clear right, for example, to payment in US dollars, when we get to another part of the contract, we can say you need to use clear, clear words would be required to take away the right that has been given in the other part of the contract, giving the clear right. Now, the problem with that, uh, I think, is that contracts are construed as a whole. So the one supposedly clear part of the contract, oh, from its inception, is impressed with whatever other rights and obligations are given rise to by the other part of the contract. It's all, it's all one whole. And what you do when you construe a contract is you look at the contract as a whole and work out what the very, various parts of it mean by considering the other parts of it. It's only once you've considered the whole contract that you know what any individual part of it really means. Um, the Supreme Court said they were that we persuaded them that perhaps Gilbert Ash didn't apply in its traditional way but they said that nevertheless by analogy the approach that Murr uh, uh, urged them to take was a legitimate one so that if you find a clear right in one part of the contract uh, clear words might be required in another part of the contract uh, to to remove what appear to be those clear rights and uh, I, I think that that d takes this Gilbert Ash principle or the analogous principle that they were they were setting out. It, it, it take th this is a new thing uh, um, uh, in my view. And uh, what was I think disappointing from our point of view is that the the, the another very well known uh, presumption, which is that force majeure clauses are to be construed narrowly, precisely because they. Uh, uh, permit a party to uh, uh, cease or suspend a performance that it has given and therefore take away rights from, the par for, for, from a party. Um, uh, 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 that, that seemed obviously to us to apply but um, receives no mention in uh, the Supreme Court's judgment. So uh, RTI were, were asked uh, to accept that MERS right in euros, uh, right, right to be paid uh, in US dollars, um, w was not to be taken away uh, unless clearly uh, 
by the force majeure clause, but RTI's right to uh, be supplied with uh, vessels to carry its cargo uh, was um, uh, subject to suspension or uh, cessation under the force majeure clause, um, uh, even though the force majeure clause, uh, the reasonable endeavours clause, does not actually say that non-contractual performance uh, non-contractual solutions to force majeure events uh, are, are off the table. So those are the, those are the three observations. I hope I'm Very dignified in defeat, time. James. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions, particularly for James, um, on uh, RTI Muir? Yeah, Tom isn't a plant. He's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got my little list here. Um, no, and this is kind of just comes up because I've been dealing with a case at the moment that, that's all about the timing of payment uh, uh, under uh, sort of refund guarantees in different, different currencies. Um, but a lot of the cases on that obviously talk about when payment actually occurs. And there's quite a theme in those of the really you can say payment occurs when the receiver's bank decides to credit their account. In this case, MER, obviously. And you mentioned that MER's bank would have basically immediately converted it to US dollars. So if, if you follow that line, why then is MER not being paid in US dollars if actually at the moment its bank decides to credit its account, it's done in dollars? Well, I mean, we went through all, we had all those, I mean, those, we haven't talked about them today, but, um, but we went through all those arguments of, of arguing that the contract didn't uh, require us to pay in US dollars. If it did, we had paid in US dollars. Um, I think it, it uh, the, certainly in Mer's position was that, that they would have been, in, they, uh, they were, uh, they would have been and they were entitled to tell their bank not to accept euros, if that's what, were, what was offered to them, and uh, and that's the that's the sort of fundamental point that that rests on. Uh, the bank was their agent, and they could have told them not to accept them, um, which they did. <laughs> All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions. Um, Firstly, let me thank our panel very much for a very uh, interesting and very fair commentary on the recent decision. So thank you. Thank you. Um, can we thank Gemma for uh, a wonderful job in uh, chairing the panel and keeping us all in order? We're <laughs>